Felix and Tony. Half a day, people of Guam. Welcome back to On the Trail with uh, Felix and Tony. Uh, I believe this is episode number five. And Senator, we're happy to be here again uh, with this podcast. I'm Felix Camacho, former governor of Guam and candidate for the upcoming 2022 gubernatorial election, a candidate for governor. And of course, joining me every week is my running mate, Senator Tony Adda. Off a day. Off a day. Well, um, we'd like to. As we go into this thing, there there have been uh, quite uh, it's been quite an interesting week uh, as we've gone through the campaign. We had our central district meeting uh, up in Manilao, and uh, many thanks, of course, to to Doris and uh, and Ray Blas, you know, for for their hospitality and for the central committee and, and all those that had come out and supported us. It's always an exciting time to come together, and um, there's a real familial feeling you know and as we gather together the food that's presented the donations that are given the opportunity for the senatorial candidates uh, those running for the uh, attorney general have also shown up and of course our congressional candidate to mingle among the crowd and meet with them and um, and as a family gathering together building momentum building excitement and encouraging everyone to reach out network and 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 remind everyone that we've got this upcoming election for the primary coming in in august so you said it right governor it it was it was a family gathering and that that's what it is you know all different families that came together in that one central location for our 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 central meeting and it was such a a fabulous time to to be with them and to uh mingle and talk with them as well that's right and we're looking forward to uh this sunday's Gathering uh, up up for the up in the the northern district in Dedido by the old flea market. So, please join us at. Uh, well, by the time you're hearing this podcast, it's probably over. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, we look forward to and encourage all of you to come out and vote for the primary election. Yes, sir. So coming up, we have uh, clearing the record, yes. and uh, the first the first thing I wanted to clear was, can you hear me? Absolutely. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, because I. <laughs> I know earlier I turned up the volume on your headset, and I said, half a day. And then you, you would say, hey, it was too loud. I, oh. My eardrums are still uh, working. They're still working? Absolutely. Okay, okay. <laughs> that's great. So as you know, this past week, we've been uh, the legislature has been in session, and we were uh, going back and forth on uh, the first couple of days uh, on the uh, projection of revenues and things like that. And uh, what was one of the issue was uh, the... the uh, educators pay uh pay plan Mm -hmm. and it was brought up that you know we were uh, we were inquiring with uh doa whether uh, the governor had already submitted the plan to the uh legislature and you know uh director byrne uh, said that no it hasn't been submitted and you know it was a back and forth issue Mm -hmm. so you know we told them that by law it had to be uh, submitted and unfortunately, you know, um, it didn't it didn't go as we expected to, where mm. they would just comply and, and move forward. Uh, Adeloupe had to come out with a release saying that, uh, you know, uh, we don't support uh, educator pay uh, pay raises, which is the furthest from the truth. You know, that that was that notion was just it, it was ridiculous. You know. It was about the process of how it was going about. And lo and behold, what happens? The interim superintendent just this past week submitted the educator pay plan as required. Well, I, Senator, I, I, what I'm concerned about is, is how the legislative body, uh, this is the primary function of a legislative body, and the Guam legislature is to pass a budget. Right. Every single year, you're 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 doing your due diligence, and um, and the revenues that are are required and the reporting. Having been a director at Civil Service Commission, I I truly understand. Uh, we had the Hay Study back back in the day. Actually, it goes back to 1992 for the Unified Pay Plan. Mm-hmm. Having to switch an entire pay structure and the methodology upon which we did it, but but whatever is recommended. Uh, for pay, it, it has to be justified, and then it also has to be, you've got to ensure that you've got the money that would allow for that pay increase and then s- sustain it because 
the system is built uh, to a point where every 18 months or 24 months or so, you have these incremental increases that are that are uh, pegged in and granted to the employees based on their performance. What I noticed was that um, coming out of Adaloop and the line of questioning from both yourself and Senator Ada, I mean, Blas. Senator uh, Frank Blas, they, it was politicized mm -hmm. and it was intended, I, I feel, to, uh, as an attack upon the Camacho Ada um, team right. and the, the good senator and anyone else who would question and try and, and uh, figure out the methodology and simply ask for the study that analyzed uh, teacher pay increases and, and would justify it. Exactly. So it was heavily politicized, and now you are saying that the report was finally released. So it was finally released, and granted that when you look at the report, it was dated May 11th, mm -hmm. 2022. We're already in August. Mm -hmm. All the governor had to do was just submit it so that we can go over it. So with without the submission, actually, what this had done mm -hmm. was made Senator Blas even dig further deeper into what, you know, how did it transpire, what, how, what funds were used to to pay from May 23rd, that the day that she authorized it, to September 30th. Mm -hmm. And you can recall back in the media, the education department came out and said, well, we're gonna, we're gonna request of the federal government, uh, USDO, that we reprogram federal funds to uh, take care of the, the, the pay from May 23rd to September 30th. Mm -hmm. What we found out in that process is that the funds that were taken or reprogrammed were funds that were originally intended to take care of electrical priorities, structural priorities, plumbing priorities. So Air conditioning. Exactly. So the thing that is very concerning is that are we going to be able now to go back to the federal government and say, well, we need funds now for electrical, for structural, for plumbing, because we told them earlier now that we don't need it. We need a pro repro we can reprogram those funds. So who now is going to bear or at least mention to the kids when the toilets don't work, there's no air conditionings in the room or the ceilings falling that because the funds were reprogrammed earlier, now we can't take care of those issues. It's concerning, Senator, because if the monies have been reprogrammed uh, out of those sp specific areas, you now are jeopardizing the, cell, the, 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 the um, health and the safety of our students, teachers and administrators in that structure, in that facility. And remember, there, there are... Um, with 30 plus schools on, on this island right now. And so taking from that, it really jeopardizes again the, the safety and, and health of our students. And uh, that's something that they would have to think about yeah. again. And to think while all this was happening, mm -hmm. the CRER report showed that the our local government had in excess of $80 million. So we, she, in, a, in, in essence, they they rob DOE of those federal funds to take care of those priorities and held that $80 million to, for whatever reason, we don't know. So in essence, this, this report that was now submitted, or the plan that was now submitted, will more than likely raise more questions than provide answers, I, I would imagine, as, as you peruse through it and... and uh, and the legislature then debates the, this this whole issue. Yeah, definitely. And you know, once again, it doesn't. The teachers are the innocent party in all this, mm -hmm. because all this was made on a campaign promise, and they took from DOE in order to fulfill a campaign promise. Yes, that's the unfortunate thing of all this. Teachers are not. They're not. They have nothing to do with this. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, I, it's going to be for the administration to, to answer. And unfortunately, it's going to be the interim superintendent now, mm -hmm. uh, former Senator Francis Santos, to, to kind of find out where now, how can he traverse this, this uh, potted road mm -hmm. and, and get education back on track and how we can, how he would be able to get these facilities back up to par and get these air conditioners back into, you know, in operation so that our children can be comfortable in their learning environment, you know? Yeah, there's a real challenge, I believe, uh, in the future, and, and this is something that needs to be focused in on. Uh, the school system and schools have been built uh, over the last 50 years. Uh, in my time, dating back to, uh, to th again, when I was in office, most especially in my second term, where we were able to build five new schools using a municipal lease plan and, and uh, of course, the compact impact monies to pay for that over time. Um, we need to be creative. Uh, there has to be a master plan that is inclusive of what the vision for Department of Education is in the way of facilities and how we can begin to either rehab, renovate, improve, repair, or build new facilities and new schools for the students down the road. The Department of um, Education has a, a, a tremendous challenge ahead of itself. And um, although they are a kingdom on their own in, in a way that they have an elected school board, they have their own superintendent, associate superintendents, and an, an entire administrative structure, uh, it, it's going to require a cooperative effort with the executive branch mm -hmm. and with all relevant agencies in how to move education forward in the way of facilities. Um, and there are opportunities, as we know, there was a recent, we talked about it, the recent opening of iLearn and, uh, and charter schools. So thank you very much, Senator, for clearing the record. Um, we much appreciate that, and, and we thank you for your frankness and your honesty in this. Uh, thank you, Governor. And, you know, we look forward to, you know, finish out this budget process. Hopefully we get it done by, uh, by next week, Friday. Uh, we'll be able to move forward and, you know, whatever the outcome is, uh, whether the budget passes or fails, we, we all have wait. We'll, we'll wait yeah. to see what that, that comes to. Fantastic. Now, moving on, I, I'd like to mention a comment from a teacher that I heard the other night, and it was about school safety. Mm-hmm. And and that and it was a comment made in relation to the uptick in crime uh, and the issue of law and order in our community. And the comment was very interesting. When they had reflected on the what's happening and the violence in the of the schools in the United States of America, and um, the tragedy of school shootings, whether they be perpetrators that are fellow students or, or members from outside of the community uh, with the intent to bring harm and mayhem and uh, injury to our, our school children, the students themselves had told the teacher that perhaps it's only a matter of time that this type of event would happen on our island, in our school. And I've been thinking, if that happens, how will I react what shall I do, and what's going to happen to us? So I was a bit taken aback because it is even our own school students that are concerned about safety, about law and order, and, and the violence that's happening in our community. And, and you know, so I'd like to uh, address some of our concerns. And let, let's talk about this as our topic of the day, law and order. Law and order. Senator, would you like to... Uh, Comment anything on this. Let's let's begin this. Well, I think it, it goes way back to uh, what do we have for law and order? There's absolutely no law and order in our community at this time. Mm -hmm. It's not an, an uptick in, in crime. Crime has just exploded through the roof. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we have murders. We have child molestation. We have illegal immigrants coming in onto our island. We have robberies. We have, I mean, just everything that has been going on these past several years mm -hmm. has just been on the rise. And we need to put a stop to it. We need to ensure that 
our community because you know our community out there they're not safe you know it was said that our island is safe our island is not safe mm -hmm. and i i went uh i went uh canvassing uh last sunday up in the dededo area and a lot of the folks there you know they were just concerned with everything that was going on even when you see a campaign sign and we said, hey, uh, can we can we put our sign on your on your fence? They said, yes. They said, yeah, but we, we noticed you have one of the other candidates signed there. And she goes, yeah, but we don't know how it got there. Mm -hmm. They said, well, can you remove it? No, we're scared. So the fear that is instilled in people, not just on crime, but look at this, even just to the, sim the simple thing of putting a campaign sign on a fence, people are scared to remove it because they don't know what's going to happen. So we need to we need to circle back and do what we need to do to inst re to instill law and order back into our island. And we'll be right back. The people of Guam are outraged at the growing crime rate and lack of justice on Guam. They are outraged at the number of criminals arrested, released, and back on the streets committing more crimes. This must not be allowed to continue. Along with crime prevention and reduction initiatives, Felix and Tony will work with lawmakers, law enforcement, and the courts to reduce repeat offenders. Crime prevention, rehabilitation where possible, and harsh punishment for criminals. This will be justice for all. I'm Felix Camacho, and I approve this message. All too often, governments do too little in some areas, but too much in others. The Camacho Ada team wants GovGuam to provide basic services and otherwise stay out of people's lives. Government overreach will not happen in the Camacho Ada administration. And they believe in three co-equal branches of government, not having one exert power over the others. For more on Felix and Tony's plans for government services, visit CamachoAdaForGuam.com. I'm Felix Camacho, and I approve this message. And now, back on the trail with Felix and Tony. I'd, I'd like to share something. I, I listened to a certain podcast that, uh, and it was about an, from an author that, that wrote a certain book, um, a very interesting individual named Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, and uh, he is what is called a Messianic Jew. He's a Jew, a practitioner, he is a, a teacher, he's a rabbi, and he wrote a book called Return of the Gods. And in that discussion, or um, as he began to explain the uh, contents of his book and, and the theme of it, he says, when you think about all that's happening in this day and age, and people are saying, how did this happen all of a sudden? He says, you have to go back in time and look at what's happened in our culture. Now, Tony, you and I have grown up in a, in, in a time where the family structure was there. We were very fortunate. You had mom, you had dad, you had brother, you had sister. You had your cousins, you had your uncles, your, your aunts, the extended family. We had church. We had school. We had um, civic activities, whether you're playing um, back in the day midget football or you're playing Little League baseball. Uh, and, and basketball down at the village court or volleyball. Whatever you were doing, life was simple and, 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 and it was safe and it was wholesome. So how did that move from the 60s to here we are uh, where our people are afraid to even step out of their, their door in the evening? Um, and he said that the values and principles that have eroded over time, um, it's been an attack on culture. Now, the whole discussion is as to who's behind this and who's that, um, uh, all these other, maybe they may call them conspiracy theories, but he said, listen, a survey was taken about what is it that people in this day and age are looking at, and, and they broke it down by percentage. What are their so-called idols? What is it that they are pursuing? The largest, uh, the highest percentage was comfort. The second was they're looking for control or security or safety. Third, money. Fourth, approval of others. Followed by success, social influence, power, whether it be political or, or, or in your workplace or in your, in your society. Love, whether it be romantic or, or sexual and, and, or none of the above which was a very s slow percentage. And so it's, it, it said that as you pursue, as individuals began to pursue 
all of these so-called idols uh, as an individual pursuit. They forgot about relationship with others. And then he went on to tie that um, the fact is that in our community, by law, with the U.S. Supreme Court and, and, and decisions made by our lawmakers in this nation of the United States, they said, God, get out of our culture. We don't want you anymore. When they took prayer out of school, when they took the Ten Commandments out of the public square, when they said you must now separate state and religion, and there's no, there's no mingling of it, it then began the erosion of the values and principles of a nation that was founded as a Judeo-Christian uh, nation, patterned after the nation of Israel. And, uh, and so, again, understanding that that's his perspective of, of how he sees it, but it's a fascinating book. It's on order. It's actually on back order. I can't wait for it to come in and understand a bit more. But um, the bottom line is, is that, yes, when we look at where Guam is now, where, where we are in relation to the United States, where we are in relation to this region, and where we are in relation to this, this world, um, we are following in the same path and track of all other mostly Western nations. Mm -hmm. and, um, but that's why, you know, when, when we look at um, the, the foundation of law and order, Mm -hmm. And what we need to do to rebuild that foundation is that uh, w rebuilding families to ensure that there's a sound family structure. Absolutely. So that people know that they have their families to fall back onto. Mm -hmm. Rebuilding employment so that people will know that they have a job that they can provide their families with the, the nutrients and the shelter that their family deserves. And then having all that so that we can ensure that when we go out into the public that we're safe because people that are happy, people that are employed, we ensure that that happiness now goes around. Because when we look at how we, we the, the society today is that there's so much drugs on the street, there's so much uh, robbery that's going on because people are not employed people don't have their families we need we need to have those two structures built and faith put back into into people's uh, uh hearts yeah you know and then we really need to look at also what is it that our law enforcement agencies are lacking yeah because when when you got when you got them coming out publicly in the media saying that I don't know if I can if I can rely on on my partner to to have my back when we go in on patrol or things like that that is concerning because now the public they're scared now the law enforcement officers are giving them that reason now to be scared because they don't know if they can be uh, you know uh, uh, there for each other so all this has to go back to the leadership of not just uh, the department, but also the administration. What are they doing today to ensure that they get more patrol officers on the street? Because the last count I checked, they've been losing officers and not increasing it like their, com their, their, uh, their campaign commitment four years ago. So there's, there's something that is not right and they need to really go back tra backtrack and see where they failed because it is a failure to the community when the community has to be the one to say hey there's a there's a, something going on here and you know what thank goodness that they have these neighborhood watch programs out there mm -hmm. you know thank goodness for that because neighbors are looking out for each other absolutely you know because you know, absolutely the, the, the police can't be everywhere at in, in split seconds but at least with these neighborhood watch now they can they can rely on one another but we don't want government to rely on the people government needs to step up and put their best foot forward so that they can know and tell the people and reassure the people that we are going to have a safe community and that's when we when we get in sir we need to ensure that we upbeat this 
this uptick in crime. We we take it away, that we lower it, that we, you know, do everything that we can give to the law enforcement officers, not just the tools, but the personnel that they need to have a safer island, a safer community, so that our families can be safe. I wholeheartedly agree with you, and law and order is certainly going to be one of the top priorities of our administration, and I'm telling you that we can, nobody can deny what is going on in this island right now. The administration cannot say that uh, and ignore the fact that crime and the fear in this community is is great. And, uh, and and to say that no everything is okay uh, or 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 just ignore it is simply is is simply unacceptable to the people of Guam. In talking, I had a very interesting conversation. I sat down a gentleman that is now living a full, productive life, fully employed with a skill that um, that is highly desirable got a great job, travels the region, spent 20 years in prison. He made a mistake as a young man. He paid the price, and he's out there now working, raising a family. And along with him, I sat down a police officer who was once uh, at a very high-ranking level of leadership. And I said, I'm going to ask you a question, and would you answer me this if you could talk to the people of Guam and tell them from your perspective what is it that's needed to deal with the crime issue, what would you have to say? The former prisoner said empowerment. We need to empower the people. He said... Uh, you know, I've been in, he said, he's been in prison. He's seen all that's happened over time. Uh, he knows how it operates. He knows what goes on in the, out there, but, or in the prison. But he said, if a, if a criminal is not going to be held accountable, if they're going to be arrested, sort of, he said, he used the term of uh, fishing, like catch and release. Mm -hmm. He says, if you're going to be caught, if it's a catch and release, you're going to go back to doing the same old thing because there's no consequence. But he was asking, why is it that, um, why is it that security, private security at, at different businesses do not have um, a firearm? The police officer said, you have to understand what's happening with these, uh, with these businesses. If you're going to hire a private security and you want it to be armed, there's a cost. And the security company also, there's a cost where they have to get liability insurance. They have to be, have their people properly trained, properly certified. E properly equipped, and and then um, ensure that they can carry out their job. The customer is going to have to pay for that, and so the the cost of security rises. The prisoner then said, "Well, but if there's no enforcement, there's no prevention." And we began to talk about what's happening to many vis businesses out there that are vandalized, that are broken into, uh, the suffering that they they have, and and then the fear in their community. He says, yeah, there's another individual that was complaining that uh, in 3 o'clock in the morning uh, in my village street, I've got some drunkard out there who's uh, ranting and raving, throwing rocks, damaging cars, um, taking a, a baseball bat or machete, cracking windshields, and, and there's no one there to respond. Where is the, where is the presence? And then we're, we're afraid to go out there and confront this individual because he's armed. And so um, these are just examples of, of what's going on. But... Um, they said there's a lack of police presence in, in the village, in the community. And, um, and with drugs, that's the other, the other issue. You wonder why there's such homelessness out there. He says many of these individuals, um, you know, they got out of prison. All right. Nobody wants to hire them. They've got a, they've got a criminal record. They can't get a job. The families rejected them. And so what do they have to do? They resort back to crime so that they can, they can get um, some money. And then they get depressed, they get into alcohol, they get into meth, um, you know, and, and eventually they're back in that circle again. And sometimes the best thing for them is to, all right, I don't have a place, I'm going to live on the streets, I'm going to commit a crime, and then eventually I'm going to end up in jail again, but at least I've got a head, I've got a roof over my head, 
I've got uh, a warm shower, I've got a bed to sleep on, and I've got a, three warm square meals a day. And so how do we break this cycle? Uh, bottom line is, he said, there are many people in our community that are hurting. Uh, and, and it's more than just putting police on the streets and, and building bigger prisoners. There's something at the core of our community that is broken. And we need all the resources we can, whether it's the private sector, whether it's the faith community, whether it's the government of Guam, whether it's other counselors. But we need to come together and find a solution to this because uh, the people of Guam are suffering and crime, crime is there. You can open the paper, he said, every single day. Turn to the, the, either the front page or page number three and you'll see what's happened in our community. And he says it's a constant. That's something you can count on reading about every single day. Yeah. So we need to get tough on crime. We need to est establish law and order, and we need to fix the system. The system needs to be fixed. Absolutely. The catch and release doesn't work. Doesn't you know? work. And uh, you were on you were on the show with uh, with Tony Lamarena yesterday. Absolutely. Him being a former uh, DOC uh, director, mm -hmm. you know, he he knows what what goes on at, at the department, and yeah. you know what what needs to be done as well up there, and you know it's just bringing back bringing back the, that that sense of security into the community mm -hmm. is first and foremost priority well thank you sir and you know beyond the the, t the crime that we read about there's still domestic violence there's sexual violence um, there's a need for prosecution you know to step up uh, the 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 court system is overwhelmed we have our federal agencies that also must play play their part and so and the broad range of different um, uh, security agencies within the government of Guam. We all need to work together. And uh, I look forward to it. You know, I'm excited because I've been there, right? Uh, I, I know the many issues that are there, and we, um, we're we going to have to continue to work at it. And so we, uh, we've we got to have the resolve, you know. We can't let, let down on our convictions, and we have to stand firm because uh, there's going to be times when there's going to be a lot of criticism. But if you know what's what's right, what's fair, what's just, we're going to do it, Senator. We are, Governor. All right. You know that's how it's that's how it's going to be done, and and ensuring that we keep our people safe, and our families safe, and our islands safe, and our tourists safe. We're gonna okay. we're gonna be able to move on. So hey, moving on. Let's uh, let's just move to the. Um, the we've had several questions that come over social social media. We have a few minutes left on our time cop. Yeah. And uh, why don't we address these right now? Uh, we can either answer uh, answer them individually or as a team. No, we can do it. All right. First question is from Shane for Guam. Do you guys support same-sex marriage and the LGBTQ plus community? Uh, you know, sir, when I uh, earlier on, in, also in my term as as senator, mm -hmm. I've uh, I've uh, conducted same-sex uh, civil unions, and I had no issue with it. Uh, it was a responsibility that. Uh, uh, one of my my tasks as a lawmaker, and when they came to me and asked me, would I perform their their union? I said absolutely. I, I had no issues with it. Thank you, so, Senator. Yeah. And uh, you know, my as for me, I can only go back to my bedrock of faith and scripture and the good book. In the good book, um, the 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 Apostle Matthew writes about how Jesus was cornered and he was questioned by the Pharisees and the Sadducees who wanted to pin him on something so they can go after him. And they asked him, understanding that they have like several hundred different commandments or laws, mm -hmm. which is the greatest? And Jesus responded, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And he went on to say, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And what that means is that you, that is unselfishly to seek the best or highest good for others. And so with regard to this uh, supporting uh, the LGBTQI uh, plus community and, and, and all, what does God require of us but to love one another as we love ourselves? And... Um, and love is the answer. And mm -hmm. so we just have to love everyone, no matter what they've decided uh, for their lives and, and uh, their pursuits. Yeah. And love. We are all one community. Absolutely. We're all one. 
one people. Thank you, sir. There. Thank you, God. Next. Okay. So second question is from Mrs. Again. Her the gist of her um, comment or her question was she had an 18 year old son who tried to apply for a government of Guam job, and but through the whole hiring process he wasn't picked, and he she pleads that um, there's some you know something be done with the Camacho Ada campaign or the administration. Mm -hmm. um, her question was, um, would you look into privatizing government hiring? Go as governor, you know, you were at the helm, and also as the, at the uh, civil service commission, you were at the helm there too. So, what would your experiences there, sir? And I I think the the utilization of uh, private hiring firms, especially in the area of specific skill sets that, uh, say, a, a department agency or an autonomous agency or one of the three branches of government is looking for in going outside of the local talent pool or those that have applied within the government of Guam Department of Administration personnel application, it certainly makes sense to, to do that. Um, the personnel rules and regulations have been well established throughout the government agencies. And, and you know, I have to say that she has a valid concern because the way it is written right now is that um, say you've got one position and a multitude of applicants, let's say 30, they will go through, uh, take the test, uh, meet all the qualifications, and then present it before the hiring agency or the specific director is a list of the top 10. Now, who among the top 10 will you hire if you had, say, five vacancies for that one particular uh, personal classification, that one particular job, you have five vacancies. Who among the 10 are you going to pick? And let me tell you the process that's usually happened over the years. It will then be forwarded up to the governor's office. And somebody within the governor's office that is assigned to look at who is our supporters among this and who do you recommend, governor, that we hire, would then be presented the governor or so and so they're not going to say the governor says this but they're going to say here's the approved list hire these people and usually it is because of their political affiliation the personal rules and regulations are established to maintain integrity and fairness and justice and that all those that are qualified should be hired, no matter your political affiliation, whether you supported the incumbent administration or not. And I think if we establish that fairness and equity, then you're going to have people that are, are feeling that, all right, I, I've got a fair shot. Right now, it is more, man, you know, uh, I don't know if, I, if I'll get the job because I, they may think that our family didn't support, um, you know, the current administration. That has to stop. And so that's my two cents. Thank you for that, Gov. Well, do we have any other questions? That's it? That's it. All right. Thank you. Well, we got the uh, coming up on the trail. Uh, get your voices heard. The last day to vote early was yesterday. And we heard that over 4,000 voters came out. Fantastic. Yeah, we would like to say thank you for exercising your right to vote. And for those who didn't get a chance to early vote, primary election is coming up on Saturday, August 27, 2022, from 7 a.m. to 8 o'clock p.m. Where are you going to be at, sir? Where are you voting at? Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to start off with Tamuning. Uh, in fact, the wife said last night, we're going to start in Tamuning, and we're, we're going to travel together through certain villages, and then at, at some certain point, we're going to split up and cover the island. <laughs> so I've already got my directive, and... Um, I've been told you can't drive. Oh, I see. You're going to have to get a driver, but I do like driving. You like driving? Yeah, I like driving. But you know, how about you pick me up and then you can drive me? But I like your gas. <laughs> 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 and you have a nice truck. Uh, well, well, you know what? Well, I got the RAV4, so you know, I think we'll be nice and comfortable in there. Well, uh, my my Mazda is just about the same size, so okay. So you pick it's me a four up. cylinder. <laughs> We'll see who picks who up. Okay. Hey, we'll flip a coin. Okay. Yes, that. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we got we got that settled. Uh, <laughs> ask questions through our social media at Camacho Ada for Guam. Engage with us on the trail. 
by asking us questions through any of our social media platforms on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Your questions can be sent to us in text, audio, or video. You know, have we ever gotten a video or audio text? Uh, not a, no, not a Man, that would be so cool just to get an audio or video text, and, or, or more especially a video so we can pop it up onto the screen and, you, you know? Uh, yeah, 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 a video question, right? Yeah. You know, the, the, the person asking the video, that'd that be would great. be nice. That would be neat. Yeah. Um, okay, we look forward to engaging with you in the digital space and answering your questions on the show. Join us for our upcoming events this week. The Northern District Meeting on Sunday, August 21st at 5 o'clock p.m. at the Old Flea Market location in Dedido. And uh, I know you'll probably be hearing this uh, after, but, you know, we still want to put it out there. Uh, after the polls close on Saturday, come and hang out with us at our headquarters in Timuning as results come in. We hope that you continue to join us for On the Trail with Felix and Tony. It is an exciting time for both of us and our Camacho Ada team. Uh, Governor, any closing uh, remarks? Wonderful. I, I know the opportunity to register um, is still there. Yeah, you can register at the mayor's office or you can register at uh, the Guam Election Commission. And um, people, just come out. Make a difference. If you don't like what's going on, make a difference. Vote Camacho Ada. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Thank you for joining us on the trail with Felix and Tony. Tony. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.